What a privilege to be together. Amen. Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. All over the world, literally all over the world, we have brothers and sisters leaning in to the celebration of Easter beginning today. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have a, a very unusual degree of liberty and freedom. And our best way, I believe, to stand with those who do not have that is to fully exercise our liberty and freedom in celebrating Easter. Amen. I believe that. For those that don't have the freedom to invite someone or to stand in public and say Jesus is Lord or to have a, a public celebration, I, when I interact with those people around the world, and we do it frequently, they look to, to the freedoms that we have. And the, if we will use them, it's an inspiration. It gives hope to them that one day they might have those freedoms. So if I have not yet extended an invitation to you, we're going to be having a little Easter celebration this week. We're going to begin on Friday evening and then Saturday evening and then Sunday morning. And we're going to do our best to just have a full-on celebration of the fact that Jesus is alive. Amen. Uh, we will have a full menu of children's activities. They're going to be in different spaces so we can accommodate more children. When you come to campus next week, you'll be given a map, or if you're an early bird, you can go to the website and look ahead of schedule. And then we're going to have uh, the outdoor stage will be open, three crosses will be open, the catenas will actually be in here next weekend. Um, all nations and new harvest will be open. Every door will be open. And um, every room's got live worship, and the children will have a big time. So. There's still a few mugs left out there. If you haven't invited someone, please, we're not, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but our goal on Easter is not to entertain the church. We provide services for the church 50 weekends a year, and a couple of weekends of the year we ask you to help us serve the larger community, and I hope you'll do that over this, the course of this week. Um, invite somebody, be willing to disrupt your schedule, bring them with you, share a meal with them, whatever that takes. Let's share the good news of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Wednesday evening, our Wednesday evening service, we're actually having a family service. The nursery will be open up through three years of age, and the teenagers are helping us get ready for Easter. But for the remainder, it's a service for those who are helping us serve over the Easter weekend. Now, we started doing those volunteer services some years ago in different contexts, and it's changed through the years. But this Wednesday, we're going to gather with everybody who's helping Easter happen. It takes hundreds and hundreds of us, and we're going to pray for one another and invite God into the midst of what we're doing. It's always been a service that's a highlight when we look back at our year. So if your schedule permits you and you're a part of that Easter ministry team, we would certainly invite you on Wednesday night. If you're not, we're going to talk about you, but that's okay. That's okay. I'm kidding, kind of. All right. What a treat to have Jason Crabb with us this weekend, huh? Say, I always, I love meeting people who love the Lord and are giving their best to the kingdom of God. And Jason is one of those men. He and his family honor the Lord. They've worked hard through the COVID season. They, they found a way to continue. He, he told me he's, they put 80,000 miles in his truck driving to help churches open when they've been closed for COVID. So, yay God, huh? He has a product table out in the lobby. It's on the west end of the lobby. If you're directionally challenged, if you're walking towards the outdoor stage, you'll find it. It's hard to see the sun when you're in the building, so you don't know where west is. I got it. Okay. I know you know by now we're not passing offering plates just yet, but we are doing an offertory prayer. It's important. It's not just perfunctory. If it was, we'd stop doing it. The corporate prayers of God's people. I assure you there will come a time where you will be dependent upon the corporate prayers of God's people. And we want to develop that muscle when it doesn't feel as urgent. So when it's needed, we're prepared. Why don't you stand with me for that prayer? If you're joining us digitally in some other place, you can stand with us as well. We'd welcome you. And put your coffee down for just a second. I meet people all the time now that says, when you tell us to stand, we put our coffee down and we stand up. And I'm like, good. Very good feels appropriate today to pray for this Easter week, this Holy Week, as God's people gather around the world, that there will be no hindrances, there will be no interruptions, there will be no consequences unintended.
for those who choose to celebrate. And for those of us that have the freedom and the liberty to do so, that we will do it with a true enthusiasm. You know, people, I, I'll get mail every year of some, or some communication, you know, we shouldn't have a hot air balloon on campus or, you know, somebody saw a bunny in the lobby and it just blew their faith. <laughs> just further, I'm not confused. I know Easter is not about chocolate and bunnies. I understand that we will, we will focus our messaging on the redemptive work of Jesus of Nazareth. But if a casual observer just glanced, we also want them to see the joy of God's people. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, thank you. Thank you for the great freedoms and liberties that we have to celebrate you. And we thank you for the freedom we have this Easter, that we're not locked down or shut in because of a threat of a virus. Lord, you have brought freedom to us and you have kept us and we praise you for that. And we pray for your people around the earth today, Lord, in every setting, in every circumstance, in many cultures, in many languages, and in many places. I pray that the name of Jesus would be exalted from nation to nation and continent to continent. May the high praises of God rise up to heaven from the earth. We thank you for that. And Lord, in the place that we have to serve, I pray that you would oversee each detail. May it be a peaceful week, a celebratory week, May the presence of God be so real upon our campus that those who gather will have a revelation of Jesus that transforms their future. We thank you for the honor of serving you. May you be pleased with our efforts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. <clears throat> You should have received an outline when you came in. If you didn't, maybe a neighbor would share with you. It's a Christian concept. If you tear it in half so that you only have part of it, that's socialism. That's another concept. So, no, 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 do not. Let's not go there. I had. I had a plan for the messaging th through these days, and um, this past, in these past few days, the Lord reordered that for me a bit unexpectedly. So it's a bit f fresher on my heart, but I think it's relevant to what we are watching. I, I want to continue a study we began actually last evening. My voice was a little iffy, so I don't know how well we began it, but we're going to talk about visions of the future. And the real heart of the discussion has to do with our ability to see, not just with our physical eyes, but to understand the things of God, to, to see with our spiritual eyes. You see, I believe as Christ followers and as the church of Jesus Christ, we should have an awareness and understanding and anticipation and insight into what God is doing that people who don't serve the Lord would not have. And if we don't have that, then I think we need to try to understand our faith and to understand why. And it's, it's really the goal of this. It's, it's not a new thing with this generation. I, I, I don't imagine that we're somehow unique, that we've wandered off the path a bit, that no one's ever done that before. Clearly from Scripture, that's not the case. But I do know that if God provides us with an awareness of our condition, He'll give us the opportunity to be different. And so we have to have the hunger and the desire to understand our condition. Have you ever not felt well, but you were afraid to go to the doctor? You didn't hear what they were going to say, or maybe you didn't want to go to the dentist? Amen, brother. All right, but ultimately, you know that there's really not a pathway to get better until you get a good diagnosis. A good diagnosis, even if it's news you don't want to hear, is the first important step to getting better. And I believe we're in that place as the church. We need God's truth. We need God's perspective in such a way that we can respond to it and we can put ourselves in positions for God's best in our lives. So that's our target through this little series. With God's help, we will work towards that. I want to start on Isaiah 42. The prophet is talking to the covenant people of God, and he's talking to them about their inability to see, but God's willingness to help them. He says, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. And he's not talking about physical blindness. 
Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. But those who trust in idols, who say to images, you are gods, will be turned back in utter shame. Hear you, deaf, and look, you blind, and see. Who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger I send? Who is blind like the one committed to me? Blind like the servant of the Lord. He said there's a uniqueness when, the, when God's servants walk in darkness. He said it's a far greater limit than just forfeiting your physical sight. You have seen many things, but have paid no attention. Your ears are open, but you hear nothing. We have so much, so many freedoms and liberties and opportunities and so many churches to choose from and Christian television and Christian radio and the internet and books and Bibles and so much. And it seems to me that we struggle to comprehend, to understand, to have insight. It's not a new challenge. In Matthew 23, Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders of his day, the generation to whom the Messiah was sent. So there's not a shortage of a message. There's no shortage of the divine intervention of God. There's no shortage of the dramatic, the miraculous, the supernatural. It's impossible to imagine a better scenario than to be the generation that welcomed the arrival of the Messiah. Agreed? And you would expect the religious leaders, the one who've studied the prophets and spent their lives in religious training and are fully invested in religious service to be the most welcoming of the group. So if you looked at the world today, you'd look at the nation with the greatest freedoms and the greatest liberties and the most churches, the most access to the Word of God, and you would think that would be the place where the Word of God would be alive and vibrant and the people most enthusiastic and most yielded and most submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. Listen to what Jesus says, Matthew 23, you blind fools. People say to me, you know, Jesus was all about love. He was a hugger, you know. Just had a big heart and welcomed everybody. Well, I'm thinking if you were in this conversation with him, when he looked at you and said, you blind fools, that was not just like a warm kumbaya moment. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? I mean, he, he was coming for them. It's a larger context, and he didn't relent sentence after sentence, moment after moment, in public. He didn't take them in the quiet place over in the side. He took them on in public and said, you're a bunch of blind fools, you're blind guides. Don't follow these people, he said. Jesus. In Matthew 23, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. So can we establish the point that it's been a challenge for God's people through the centuries, through the ages, different settings, different historical contexts, different political environments, all sorts of things changed, but the covenant people of God, the people that were walking in the, the greatest revelation of truth that was available to them, that was available to them, found themselves spiritually deaf and blind. So I think we have to pause for a moment and say, is, the, is it possible, is there any degree to which that could be said of us? You know, it seems to me that our nation has been on a pathway leading away from a biblical worldview for several years. It's not something that's happened in the last year or with the last election or with the last few election cycles. This isn't something urgent that has happened to us. We may have approached something of a tipping point, but it isn't new. The church or the community of Christ followers, whichever label you prefer for God's people, I would submit to you have been willing co-conspirators in what we have watched happen. This has not been done to us. Darkness does not overcome light. The only way for darkness to increase is to diminish the light. So we have to have the courage and the boldness of soul to look at ourselves and say, the circumstances in which we find ourselves is every bit as much self-inflicted as something that has happened to us. They told us some time ago not to speak about our faith, that we shouldn't take our faith into the public sphere, to the marketplace, or to the corporate boardrooms or the corporate settings. That wasn't the appropriate place to talk about Jesus or to pray out loud or to discuss our faith or what we believe about how that impacts our world. We were told to leave that out of the halls of the hospitals or the courtrooms or the classrooms of our children. Was it welcome in the halls of academia? And the reason we were told this was that someone might be offended. 
And if you dared to transgress that suggestion, someone would be offended, and they would raise their hand, and there would be a microphone provided, and they would say, I was offended, and the message would be reiterated, you shouldn't do that. It's inappropriate. Stop doing that. We were told we had no right to push our beliefs upon someone else. Now, here's the awkward truth. We complied. We politely and rather demurely yielded to evil. We took our faith out of those places. We took our language around our Lord away from those settings. We made our faith a private thing. We thought, well, as long as we can gather inside our church buildings and talk about what we believe, surely we'll be okay. Well, today, some decades into this debacle, we find those same settings, the marketplace, the corporate settings, the halls of authority and power are being dominated by a worldview that is unacceptable to Christ followers. And it's being expressed with a very aggressive advocacy for adoption of the prevailing worldview in all of those settings where they told us not to use our voice. Our children's classrooms, the halls of academia, the corporate settings have all become platforms, pulpits, if you'll allow, for the proclamation of a worldview that stands in opposition to that of a Christ follower. In fact, if you oppose this new orthodoxy, you'll face removal from the public square, legal threats. You'll be threatened with financial ruin. Well, may I ask a question? Whatever happened to the notion that one's personal beliefs shouldn't dominate the public square? From the vantage point where I stand today, and this is about as much upon me as anyone else, we were foolish. We were foolish. And we will not get to a better place until we recognize that. I think it's time for us to speak up. The litany of what we are hearing... <clears throat> it's not always immoral. Sometimes it's just illogical. Because once you separate yourselves from the moorings of God's truth, and you begin redefining words and terms and expressions, you, you lose your boundaries. Not all truth is subjective. And it becomes easier to be deceptive and to tell a lie than it does to tell the truth. I made a list of some things we hear, and, and they're not all moral issues, but they, they all certainly have implications for our lives. It's time to speak up. The truth is open borders do not reduce poverty. In fact, if the case for our own nation, they will increase it. Electric cars. And I don't oppose them. If you have one, you want to give it to me, I'm all in. No, no problem with that. <laughs> but just for clarity's sake, they are not an expression of renewable energy think. It takes a fossil fuel to make the electricity to drive that battery-operated wonder. And it may prove to be a better mousetrap, but it's not about environmental support. Your biological sex certainly is not confusing. And it really isn't difficult to determine. And If there's confusion around it, that is a very difficult place, and I have tremendous compassion, but it shouldn't be unleashed or expanded. There is no free. There just is no free. Someone has to pay. <laughs> Abortion. Honestly, it really is the termination of a human life. It isn't confusing. Come on, we need to go. Liberty and freedom. Liberty and freedom come from God. They don't come from governments. In fact, the, the history is very clear. Governments consistently, governments of every stripe, governments with different languages, from different continents, governments reduce freedom and liberty. Now, today we're witnessing the intentional dismantling of the values and behaviors which have provided our liberty and freedom. Open borders are being promoted no matter the consequences. The onslaught of transgender confusion upon our children is being mandated by an ever-increasingly authoritative government system. Folks, it is unacceptable that our elementary children would be subjected to training in gender fluidity. 
It's evil. But in all fairness, we created the vacuum. We took our faith out of those places. We stepped away. We didn't have the courage to stand. We wanted the approval. We didn't want to forfeit an opportunity. We we didn't want to be called a name. This is on us. Don't be angry at somebody else. You can't remove you can't remove something that's ungodly unless you replace it with what is godly or you'll just get something worse. If we don't have the intent to take our faith back into the public square, don't grumble about the ungodliness you see. It's serious. Financial responsibility has delivered our financial irresponsibility has delivered double digit inflation. Internationally it's even worse. We're realigning global financial practices that will leave us as a poorer people. It's not talked about, but it's happening day over day. The decline is precipitous. Most prefer not to notice. And the part that's most awkward to me is the strange silence of the church. We're not in a political battle. This has been taking place for a long time. It's a spiritual struggle. And the church, God's people, I promise you are the key. Don't feel powerless or unimportant. Your choices matter, and what we choose to do in this season will make a difference. Our theme is vision and what we see. And I want to take a few minutes and talk to you about godly vision, the ability to see, to have a spiritual awareness. It's about understanding spiritual realities. What really are the possibilities of God in the life of a person? What is the majesty of the king we serve? We've lost sight of these things. We're deaf to them. We've traded them away away in the the market of public opinion. We'd rather be seen as chic or fashionable or affluent or successful or well-educated than people of faith fully yielded to Jesus of Nazareth. And we'll point to our church attendance or some moral scorecard that we don't think we violate too grossly, but we've lost our vision. I want to use Abraham for just a moment. It's a remarkable character. Does anybody happen to remember which chapter, which book in the Bible you meet Abraham? We meet him in Genesis. It's the book of beginnings, but it's in Genesis chapter 12, very near the beginning of the story. We're introduced to Abraham, and throughout Scripture, Abraham becomes the father of our faith, the epitome of a man who believed God. So he's mentioned both in the Old, throughout the Old and throughout the New Testaments. In John chapter 8, Jesus is speaking. And he's going to speak about Abraham. So I think he's telling the truth. I trust Jesus to tell the truth. Can we agree? Okay. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Jesus is alive on planet Earth with an earth suit thousands of years after Abraham lived. And Jesus said, Abraham saw my day. Abraham understood I would stand here. And he rejoiced in it. That has to kind of settle in for a minute. Abraham had a vision, an insight, an understanding. You see, the sight we need for our lives goes beyond our physical sight. Your physical sight is of great importance. But of equal importance is your ability to to understand, to see with your spirit, to see with your heart. We have lost that. We are the people Isaiah was talking about, but God extended to that generation an invitation, and I believe he's extending one to you and me. In Acts chapter 7, it's the story of the church that's unfolding, and we're going to step into the middle of a scenario. Stephen, the critical component of this emerging church in Jerusalem is growing so fast that they can't keep up, and the apostles appoint some people to help them, and Stephen is one of the young men selected. We're told he was a man full of faith and the Spirit of God. That God did remarkable miracles through Stephen's life, and he's engaged in in presenting the gospel in the streets of Jerusalem. And he's going to receive an outcome not unlike our Lord's. He's going to be murdered in the city of Jerusalem because of his testimony for Jesus. And so the entire seventh chapter of the book of Acts is devoted to the presentation Stephen made. Think of that. How many characters in Scripture have an entire chapter devoted to one of their presentations? Not very many. He's a young man. 
I want you to note what he said about Abraham. It's Acts 7 and verse 2. To this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. That's the defining characteristic. The God of glory appeared to Abraham. Abraham saw the Lord. He saw his purposes. He saw his agenda. He understood that there was more than just a a ritualistic nature to his faith. The God of glory appeared to Abraham. We need an appearance of the God of glory. But listen, he goes on. He says, while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, Leave your country and your people, God said. Go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans, and he settled in Haran. And after the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you're now living. God didn't tell him to take his father and Lot with him. Abraham didn't get it all right. In fact, maybe before we're done with this series, we'll look at some of the struggles that Abram had. God told him to leave, to leave his family, and to go to a new place. And he participated kind of. He took his father, and he didn't make it all the way. He stopped part way until his father died, and he completed the journey, but he still had Lot. I heard one biblical scholar say that Lot was a lot of trouble. (laughs) That's true. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you're now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even a foot of ground. God said, I'm going to give this territory to you and your descendants forever. But it's worth noting that in Abraham's lifetime, The only part of the promised land that was ever technically his was a burial plot, and he had to purchase it. When he died, the fulfillment of that was still a promise to him. God said, you walk this land, and where your foot lands, I will give it to you. But it was going to be inherited by a later generation. Do you have the courage to serve the Lord so the generations who follow you will have a better life than you have? Or have we become so self-absorbed, so self-centered, So me first, that our faith is entirely about realizing the benefits and let the next generations struggle for themselves. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess that land, even though at that time Abram had no child. God spoke to him in this way. Your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they'll be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. What's he talking about? Egypt. Your descendants will go to Egypt. Abram saw the horrible suffering of the Hebrew slaves. He understood what would happen to them. I'll punish that nation they serve as slaves, God said, and afterward they'll come out of that country and worship me in this place. And he gave Abram the covenant of circumcision. And Abram became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. And Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the 12 patriarchs. It's safe to say that Abram saw the whole panorama of redemption. He saw the whole thing. It's staggering. He had a, the glory of the Lord appeared to Abram, and his faith was so remarkable. He saw the redemptive intent of God. Jesus said, Abram saw me. God showed him their slavery in Egypt and their deliverance, that they would return to this land to worship him. Would to God that most Christian believers had that same understanding, that we could look beyond ourselves and our immediate desires and preferences and see the purposes of God that are in front of us and live in such a way that they might be fulfilled. Look at Genesis 14. Abram returned from defeating somebody. (laughs) Let's just call him Bob. (laughs) Abram returned from defeating Bob, and the kings allied with him. And the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of somewhere. And then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Geography would help a little bit here. Abram's living in the southern part of Israel, and the northern kings, a group of kings, allied together. 
came through and they raided Abram's camp. They took his nephew. They took some of his possessions. It's a several-day walk to where they went. When Abram realized what happened, he gathered, he mustered the men that were under his control, and he made that journey several days. He attacked that city at night, and he put it to the edge of the sword, but he took back the people and things that belonged to him. Abram was not a passive soul. And on the way back from that encounter, he has this unique meeting. He meets the king of Salem. Salem is just the, the English equivalent of a Hebrew word, shalom. It means peace, but it means much more than that. Salem or Jerusalem. I've always smiled that the Lord caused our church to be built on New Salem Road. <laughs> we couldn't have planned that, I promise. But it says that the king of Salem, Melchizedek, it's, it's not apparent initially, but Melech is the Hebrew word for king. Zedek is righteousness. The king of righteousness came to bless Abram. A pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. It says that Abraham gave him a tenth of everything he had. God gave to Abraham this remarkable vision. It's so important to let that settle into your heart. Beginning at the point at which Abram stood, he saw all the way through to the heavenly Jerusalem that came down out of heaven. Abram saw it first in the way a family was born to him. He's childless with this promise, and he stood in that place for decades. Don't allow the, the delay in fulfillment of your dreams to cause you to imagine God has withdrawn from you. That's just wrong. He saw it in the patriarchs. He understood that from him was coming the, the beginning of the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. He saw it by faith in a nation that would be created, born in great suffering in Egypt. He saw it in the coming of a Messiah through that nation of people that would come from him. He saw it in the gospel that would go out to all the nations, to both Jew and Gentile. A Bedouin herder. So the men of every kind, kindred, and race would become a part of the family of God. He saw the church. It's amazing to me. Something so special to God, so unbelievably important. He saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. We find it all contained in his story. Abraham, in, in, in some respects, I know it's an un, it was the beginning of this vision. The beginning of a people. And it's very unfortunate to me that there are thousands, multiplied thousands of born-again believers that you and I interact with, that we know in our nation, that have no idea about this idea of a heavenly vision. What we've been coached up on, and I, I grieve this because I've been a part of this system, what we know is to read our Bibles and say our prayer and meet together. We have a routine. And we evaluate our faith and our spirituality by our tenacity and cling to our routine. I believe in those things. They're certainly essential, but don't confuse them with knowing God. Amen. We need a different outcome, folks. Our vision is impaired. Our hearing is dull. Our understanding is small. Let's humble enough ourselves to acknowledge it. This is our watch. This is our season. Abram, Abraham would be a stranger to this pattern we know. He had a vision of God which changed his life. He was delivered from an empty life. He led a life of unbelievable fulfillment. When I look at the world around us, we're chasing fulfillment in the same way the secularists do. We are. We have the same goalposts, the same objectives. We measure our success with almost identical markers. Abraham became the father of all who believed, both Jew and Gentile. How about if we determined to become a generation who gives birth to the purposes of God in a new way? Are we willing to do that? I would submit to you it's our heritage. In fact, it's our invitation from Scripture. Abraham is not alone. It would be wrong. Time limits us a bit, but we're going to work on this for a few sessions, God willing. This is our heritage. This is our invitation. I'm sorry we've been invited to be born again, to be saved, and then to get back on with our lives. It's a mispresentation of the gospel. It's deceptive. It's, it's harmful. I believe in the new birth. I believe in conversion. I believe in salvation. 
But God has called us to something greater. I want to walk with you just quickly. I chose some biblical characters that I think you will know. You'll be familiar with their general narrative. If they're not, spend a few minutes with Rabbi Google today. Because he'll introduce you to some of their backstory. But Samuel is one of the most important characters in all of the, the Bible. And, and, and certainly from a Jewish perspective, Samuel stands ahead of Daniel and so many others that you and I would consider to be heroic characters. Samuel is a transitionary figure. He's the last of the judges, that book of judges that you, you know from your Old Testament. Samuel is the last of the judges because after Samuel, there's a monarchy implemented. And Samuel's the character that God asked to bridge that transition. Samuel began serving the Lord as a very, very as a small child. His life begins with the promise of his mother, who had no children, and promised God if he would allow her to conceive that she would give the child to the service of the Lord. And she conceived and gave birth to Samuel. And she relinquished him to the care of the priest when he was but a boy. Samuel grew up in the service of the Lord. Parents, we need a desire to see our children serve the Lord. If the Christ followers don't have a desire to see our children serve the Lord with their whole heart, mind, soul, and body, where do we think the leadership from the church is going to come from? Why do we aspire for them to the, for the same things that the ungodly are seeking? Because we don't attach enough value to the things of God. We don't think the rewards are legitimate. We don't think the promises are real. Because all we can see is our routine, and, and where would serving the Lord fit into that routine? I almost missed God's invitation in my life because I couldn't imagine a place in the routine. When I went to church as a boy, ministers wore long black robes and vestments. I don't ever remember seeing a, a leader of a religious service smile, let alone laugh. And I, I could not imagine yielding my life to that. It was more about little of God in me than it was anybody else's fault. But I almost missed the invitation. Samuel saw the outcome of a king. Samuel saw the pride of Saul. He saw the heart of David. He had a vision and awareness and understanding that those around him didn't have. Again, Abram was not unique. 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is what he said to the tribal leaders when they came and they said, we want a king. Listen to what Samuel said. Israel's never had a monarchy. They've never had a king or a palace or a central government. God has been their governor. God's been their king. Listen to Samuel's understanding. This is what the king who will reign over you will do. He'll take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and his horses. And they'll run in front of his chariots. And some he will assign to be commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and to reap his harvest. And still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He'll take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves, and he'll give them to his attendants. He'll take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys, he'll take for his own. He'll take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you'll cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. And the Lord will not answer you in that day. The brightest and the best, the most powerful, the most influential in the nation of Israel are standing in front of Samuel and saying, we want a king. They're blind. They think it's going to make their lives better. They think it will enhance their portfolios, expand their influence, give their children and grandchildren a better future. And Samuel is standing in a very lonely position saying, can't you see? Can't you see? Let me tell you what it will bring. And look at their answer. The people refused to listen to Samuel. We want a king over us. The kings led them ultimately into slavery. They lost everything. Samuel could see. He had a revelation from God. Folks, we are desperate for people with vision. Amen. Joseph. Samuel's not unique. Joseph. Joseph saw his brothers bow down. He was the youngest. They were stronger. 
They had more training. They had more life experience. And Joseph saw them bow down. Joseph saw Egypt in both abundance and famine. When nobody else saw it, not Pharaoh, not his wisest counselors, not the agricultural experts, not the people for whom Egyptian was their first language, Joseph had an insight that nobody around him saw. It came from his relationship with God, and it brought a significance to his life that could not have come from an Egyptian university, from an Egyptian business adventure. We have undervalued, we have underestimated the significance of understanding spiritual things. We've said we want to be born again because we want to go to heaven, but between here and heaven, we want to do what we want to do. God forgive us. Our interest in serving the Lord has been so, you know, we, we might volunteer for something. We might give something that isn't that essential to us anyway. We'll offload our appliances, and we have better ones coming. But we've lacked the, the vision, the insight to say that the things of God are God matter more than all the things that I can touch and feel. Moses. Moses understood the power of Pharaoh when God was recruiting him at the burning bush. He said, I don't want to go back there. I know that man. I know that palace. I know that power structure. I'm not going. He argues with God through a whole host of some pretty neat tricks. Serpents and snakes in your hand and your jacket, and it comes out, and it's diseased, and it goes back, and it's clean. He's not questioning the power of God. He's saying, I understand the power of Pharaoh. I don't want to go do this. I'll get canceled. I'm going to lose. I barely got out of it the last time I was there. It was nip and tuck. This is not a contest, God. You don't understand. But he has a revelation of the glory of God. You see, you can't take the assignment until you have some insight into the glory of God. If you don't believe God is majestic and powerful and glorious, that he'll be no man's debtor, as long as you think God's still depending on you for your talent and your treasure, you'll never serve him with much enthusiasm. Folks, I don't have anything the Lord needs. The greatest honor of my life is serving him. He doesn't need my intellect. He certainly doesn't need my checkbook. He doesn't need my diligence. The honor that's been extended to me as a human being is serving the Lord and to you. And if you'll make that commitment, God will begin to give you new vision, new insight, new understanding. Moses understood the power of Pharaoh. He could see the Hebrew slaves free when they couldn't. They're complaining bitterly about, Mo, leave us alone, Moses. We liked it better before you got here. Oh, bother, I'm going to lead you out of here. They weren't cheering for him. They weren't applauding for him. They resented him. They grumbled about him until he died. Sometimes the grumbling would become so intense and so organized that God would intervene and a few thousand of them would drop into a crevasse. And the next morning the complaint line would be full again. Stupid is the word you're searching for. <laughs> I'm not supposed to use that word. <laughs> Moses saw the Hebrew slaves free. He saw the promised land. He didn't get to enter it because of his own disobedience. Folks, God's not soft. He's a God of love and mercy and grace, but he's not soft. He showed Moses the promised land from Mount Nebo. Moses saw the tabernacle. He saw it in heaven before he saw it constructed in the Sinai. Moses saw God on Mount Sinai. You talk about vision and insight and understanding. David, we know him as the greatest king of the, the Hebrew people. But David saw God as a deliverer long before he heard Goliath's name. He understood that God would deliver a lion or a bear into his hands not because he was a good shot, but because God that he worshipped was powerful. He had a vision of God. I would have had a vision of just breeding more sheep. I mean, they multiply. My father was a veterinarian. I know how that works. It happened all the time. But David had a vision of God that said, no, there's a greater power than the power of that predator. 
So that when David heard Goliath's challenge, he saw his vulnerabilities. Nobody in the entire Israelite army saw that. Not even King Saul, who was the most imposing physical presence in the entire Israelite camp. David saw Jerusalem as the city of God. It was a Jebusite city. It wasn't even under the control of one of the 12 tribes. And he said, God has chosen that city for himself. Daniel. Daniel's a slave. His life circumstances are miserable. We've talked about that. He had every reason to be bitter and angry and frustrated to hate God, to withdraw from God. But he had a revelation of God. It enabled Daniel to see the dreams of the king when the king couldn't even see his own dreams. Daniel saw the end of the exile. The Jewish people aren't living in Israel. They're not allowed to live in Israel. They're slaves in a foreign land. And Daniel saw the end of the exile. He said, it's time for us to go home. It's Daniel 9. Read it. And he begins to pray a prayer of repentance, not for the forgiveness of the sins of the wicked people that preceded him. He said, God, we have been this way. Daniel had an insight, an understanding, a vision. He saw the end of the exile. He saw the return to Jerusalem. And he saw the end of the age. We still read the book of Daniel to see what is in front of us. A Babylonian slave. Daniel had a revelation of God. This isn't unique to Abraham. We're talking about Samuel and Joseph and Moses and David and Daniel. Some prefer the New Testament. Paul, the great advocate for the gospel. God, in his wisdom, chose the rabbi of the rabbis to give the message to the non-Jews. Because he did it in such a way that the rabbis and the Jewish Orthodox community couldn't combat the wisdom of the truth he was giving to the non-Jewish people. Scripture says of Paul that he was obedient to the vision from heaven. Paul saw Jesus as king. He saw him as king of both the Jew and the non-Jew. He had a revelation. He said it of himself. He said, what I learned about Jesus, I didn't learn at the feet of the apostles. The Lord gave it to me. Paul saw the church. He saw that in all of those Roman pagan cities, those cities filled with idols and idol worshipers and idolatry, there were synagogues in those cities. In city after city, Paul began his messaging in the synagogues. And in city after city, they drove him out. He saw there was potential beyond what was happening in the synagogue. He saw that there were people that would receive the Jesus message. The synagogues were filled with devout people, biblically aware people, students of Scripture, covenant people of God with no vision, with no hearing. In fact, they are angered and furious with Paul when he visits their city with a vision from God. In city after city, they drive him out of the synagogue. We want nothing to do with you. They will stir up the political authorities to try to cancel Paul. They will follow him to other cities to disrupt his message. Paul saw the potential of the church. We get to 2 Timothy, and he's in a Roman prison, and he understands that his execution is very likely next on his agenda. He writes to Timothy, and he said, I'm persuaded that what I've committed to God, he is well able to guard against that day when I will see him. If you're just analyzing his life work at that point, if you didn't have any spiritual vision, if you didn't have a revelation of God, you'd think he was a horrible failure. His churches are struggling. The Corinthian church is immoral. I mean, they're immoral. They're drunkards. They're gluttons. They're sexually immoral. The Galatian church stepped away from the gospel, adopted another gospel under the influence of witchcraft. I mean, the churches that he spent his life planting are just teetering on the brink of destruction. And Paul sees them. And he said, there's a crown of righteousness for me. What I've done in those cities is going to change the world. Within three centuries, Christianity is the official religion of the empire. It grew from that vision in Paul's heart. In Acts 26 and verse 15... Paul is telling his story. 
He's, there's, it's his, he's reciting what happened to him on the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to him. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Now get up and stand on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. Don't miss that. Paul's in the dust. He's a very educated, very successful, very celebrated. He's been entrusted to take the, what he's been doing in Jerusalem and, and to take it to other cities. And Jesus steps in. He sees Jesus. And he said, now stop doing what you've been doing. And take up what I'm going to show you. Are you willing to let Jesus do that in your life? Or are you just going to keep telling us you're born again? Are we willing to accept a vision for a church that impacts our world? I'll be honest with you. I have sat working through this in preparation with tears running down my face from my own life. We have a routine. And I'm grateful for it. There are some good things in routines. But God is bigger than our routine. And I didn't come to chastise you. I don't want to scold you. I don't feel that in my heart. I want to invite you to begin to say to the Lord, I need to see you in a new way. I need to see you in a new way. Jesus said, Get up and stand on your feet. I think it's what he would say to us. I have some things I want to show you. Now that happens in the early part of Acts. This is Acts 26. Years have intervened between when that happened and what Paul is recording here. There are years in between that original meeting on the Damascus Road and this presentation before King Agrippa. And he says then, so King Agrippa... I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. I've chased it from that day till this. I started that journey that day with one objective, and it got interrupted, and I've never turned loose of what Jesus asked me to do. He, he gives you the description. I wasn't disobedient. To the first to those in Damascus, that was where he was headed. And then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea. Judea is the region that surrounds Jerusalem in the way that Rutherford County would surround Murfreesboro. And then to the Gentiles also, then to all the non-Jews, everybody else. I preached they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. He'd never seen that. That was completely outside of his experience portfolio. He couldn't go watch a YouTube video on how to do that. The only way he saw that was he had a vision from Jesus. He had an awareness, an insight. He could hear. It doesn't stop there. The other disciples, Nathaniel, Philip, and the others, they saw heaven open and angels ascending and descending upon Jesus. The priests didn't. The synagogue leaders didn't. The Sadducees didn't. The Roman centurions and all of their power, most of them didn't. One or two did. The governor missed it. In John chapter 1 and verse 50, Jesus said, he's talking to Nathaniel, he said, you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree? Jesus is like, really? You thought that was something? But he flips the script. He tells Nathaniel what he's going to see. What he's going to see. You'll see greater things than that, he added. I tell you the truth, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. John, the closest of all the disciples to Jesus, when he's an old man, Jesus has been gone for decades. It's not recorded anywhere in Scripture, but I have a feeling John interviewed Paul. When you saw Jesus, what did he look like? Paul's the enemy. He kills Christians. And he rolls into town and said, I saw Jesus. I bet John took him aside and said, 
Tell me about this, Jesus. You better get the answer right. Now John's an old man. It's been decades since he's seen Jesus. And in the first chapter of Revelation, it says on the Lord's day, he was in the spirit. And he heard a voice behind him. And when he turned to see who was speaking, it was the Lord. And he said, I fell at his feet like I was dead. And he put his hand on me and he said, I'm the living one. I was alive and I was dead and I'm alive forever and I have the keys of death and hell. But I have a message that you need to share. I need to show you something, John. I need you to see something. Because there are some coming behind you who are going to need to see what I could trust to you. You see, your faith, your journey, your life experience is important. Don't believe the lie that you've wasted. And it's a lie. Every part of your life journey, God will use if you will submit it to him. Amen. If you'll allow him to give you a vision of what he's doing, if you'll accept a revelation of Jesus, it will stabilize those who are coming behind you. John had a revelation that strengthens us. He didn't need it. His life was about done. He'd run his race. But listen to what he saw. As a prisoner, exiled on an island, he saw the new Jerusalem, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of incense. With the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And there were three gates on the east and three on the north and three on the south and three on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the land. Wow. Be a little awkward saying to John, you know, I did that Bible reading quite a bit. Ten minutes a day. <sighs> Folks, reading your Bible is important. But let's not live without a vision of the Lord. I'm tired of small-minded, mean-hearted believers. we got to stop saying we got it all. If we've got it all, where did we hide it? <laughs> we've got to stop saying there's really nothing to learn. We know the important stuff. Everything else is kind of irrelevant or secondary. And we start looking for sociological explanations or historical insights or to grammatical corrections, and we lose sight of the spirit of the living God. We've got to overcome this notion that there's nothing really to experience with God. We know him intellectually, and there, there's really no experience with God beyond that. Folks, God's bigger than our brains, or we're in some really deep weeds. We're going to have to leave behind the idea that we have no responsibility to stand or to grow, or to become. What are you aspiring to? Tell the truth, not your church answer. Grapple with it within yourself. We've got to stop defending ungodliness and excusing immorality. We pretend that we don't see in here because they're close to us, and there would be some cost to us if we used our voice or we said something, and we don't want the, the disruption or the, un, the, the, the discomfort that it would bring. So we just pretend, and we don't say anything, and then we share it as a prayer. But don't share a prayer if you don't have the courage to use your voice. And we've been quiet when they said, don't mention Jesus, or don't talk about the Holy Spirit. Or don't talk about being crucified with Christ. I'd rather have a more positive message. We have had veiled faces. 
And we've refused to see or even to seek the whole counsel of God. Abram saw the whole panorama of redemption. A desert dweller, a herder, saw the new Jerusalem. He saw Jesus. And he's not alone. It's our heritage. The mysteries of God are available to us. So how can we be involved in this heavenly vision? That's the question. How can we be involved? I'm out of time. I'll give you the key. Or at least I'll give you the beginning of the path. I've introduced you to three words repeatedly over these last few months. To repent, to renounce, and to release. If we start with that first one, repentance is a change of thought and a change of direction. But the, the outcome, the, the, the visible evidence of repentance is obedience. So the beginning point for today is to say, Father, I have the intent in my heart. I have the desire, my objective. I'm going to move it to the top of my priority list is to be obedient to you. And to say to the Lord, I'm sorry. It's been on the list, but its order of import has varied widely depending on what else was happening in my life. And today, Father, I would say, I want to be obedient to you. Some of us don't want to know any more truth because we don't want to be any more obedient. We're afraid God wants something from us. It's because we have no vision. The only thing we see is the world around us. And we define success in the same way they do because they have no spiritual vision. What a travesty. The spirit of the living God dwells within us. We should be able to see with the clarity and a precision, precision that Abraham couldn't or Daniel couldn't because we have the abiding presence of the Spirit of God within us. We're further along in the unfolding narrative. I want to give you an invitation. But we really don't have room for everybody to come forward. And some of you are someplace where you couldn't get forward from there, so... I don't want to leave you out. And I know it's a bit awkward, but I'm going to ask, if you'd be willing to say, Lord, I want to be obedient to you. I mean in a new way. Because most of us have some places we've been holding out. Now, I believe that obedience will yield to a new kind of vision, insight, understanding. But the first step is we've got to be willing. If you would say that to the Lord, Lord, I, I will acknowledge I have not always been willing to be obedient. In fact, I have practiced disobedience. But I want to be obedient to you in a new way. If that's you today, maybe just stand where you are. Okay, we're not going to turn the cameras on the room, so it's no, don't worry about it. If you're good to go with the Lord, you sit right there. Don't stand up on my sake. I'm done. You're not going to sit much longer, I promise. I believe God takes note. If you didn't stand yet, go ahead and stand with the rest of us. I want to pray for you. Do you know what would happen if thousands of us truly walk into Holy Week saying, God, we want to be obedient? I thank God for your lives. I do. You are precious to the Lord. You matter to him so much. Father, I thank you for your people. Lord, it's Holy Week, and we're reminded of what Jesus was willing to do on our behalf because he loved us. He could see past the suffering, he could see past the humiliation. He could see past what he was being asked to endure. He could see us. And Lord, we ask you today for a vision, for understanding, for hearing and insight, far beyond our minds or our training, our educations. 
May we see the glory of the Lord. Lord, we stand in humility to repent of our stubbornness, of the hardness of our hearts, of our reluctance to be obedient. Forgive us, Father. We stand to say, today to say we will follow you one step at a time, one response at a time. And I ask you now to give us tender hearts, receptive hearts, listening ears, and eyes that can see. Give us understanding. Give us a spirit of boldness and a fear of the Lord that will enable us to stand in whatever place you call us to. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Hey, church, I want to take a moment. I want to thank you again for joining us. I hope you enjoyed worshiping with Jason Crabb. I hope Pastor's message brought hope and encouragement. Maybe, maybe some new thoughts or insight were revealed to you. You know, as I was listening to Pastor Allen, I was reminded of another verse in the book of Acts. It's 2.17. It says, In the last day, God will pour out His Spirit on all people, that sons and daughters would prophesy, that young men would see visions, and that old men would dream dreams. And I was kind of conflicted, and I had to kind of check myself. What do I want for my son, for my daughter? Do I want them to prophesy? Do I want them to get into a certain school or on a certain ball team? I want to see my son and daughter prophesy. Depending on when the last days are and when the Lord will come back, that will determine whether or not I see visions or I have dreams. But I want to tell the Lord, I want to receive what you give me. Whether it be a vision or a dream, allow me to receive. So guys, take some time, reflect on this message. It's important. It's invaluable. But again, thank you for joining us. Really quick, Easter is next weekend, guys. I am so excited. Uh, but I want to share something really special with you. I haven't had a chance to share this with you yet, so I hope you're all still listening. We love you, online audience. We value you, online audience. So we're going to do something new. We're going to do something a little unique. We're going to do a pre-show on our live stream before Easter services on Friday and Saturday and Sunday. We want to take you around the campus and behind the scenes and literally just want to spend a little more time with each and every one of you. If you can make it to campus, great. We want to see you here. But if you'll be joining us on the live stream, we want to do something a little bit special. So make sure you log on about 30 minutes early prior to those services. Again, it's Friday at 6, Saturday at 6, and Sunday at 9.30. Be 30 minutes early of those service times, and we'll see you here for a special pre-show. But before you go, I got a special invitation from Pastor Round for you to come and join us for Easter. God bless and have a great day. It's springtime in Tennessee, and we have the privilege of celebrating Easter together. I want to give you a personal invitation to join us on our campus in Murfreesboro for an Easter celebration this year. Through the mercy and the grace of God and the diligence of a lot of people, we've, we've put COVID in the rearview mirror. We don't have to be afraid to gather together any longer. We're going to put up an outdoor stage. We're going to open all of our indoor sanctuaries. There's lots of choices. You can find a space where you're comfortable. We're having services on Friday, Saturday, and Easter Sunday morning. We have special musical guests coming, Ann Wilson, We the Kingdom, the Katinas. There'll be special activities for children of all the age ranges. It's a wonderful time to get Gather with the people of God and to invite God into the beginning of our summer, into the beginning of a fresh season. It's time for some fresh life, new growth, new hope in all of our lives. Join us in Murfreesboro for a wonderful Easter celebration. I'll see you soon on our campus.